leaders. So welcome friends to um, the last in the series on Bible study on the minor prophets, the book of the 12. And um, it's been great that you've been part of this series this summer. And many of you have said you have studied books that you never even knew existed. So we call that success. Um, this morning, Will Willimon and is our teacher and he has invited Stephen Chapman to join us, um, both Divinity School professors, uh, both active in the congregation at Duke Chapel, um, and both men who sit uh, in the chapel on the transepts, on the pulpit side, if you ever want to say hello to them. So <laughs> typically. Um, so we're delighted to have them here to lead us in a conversation about Malachi. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Holy and eternal God, we are grateful to you this day for your spirit, which is already at work among us and within us. And we pray now, Lord, as we turn to the book of Malachi, that you would instruct us, that you would guide us, and you would form us according to your will. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Gentlemen, yeah. it's yours. Wonderful to be with you again. And I thought it'd be fun to have Stephen join in because Stephen began this journey. Uh, I like it the way Carol said that this is the book of the 12 prophets, that it, I think it's important to see the uh, minor prophets in their distinctiveness, but also in their unity. And we end in present canon with uh, Malachi. It's, it's, Carol also noted that it's kind of judgment, judgment, judgment every week uh, from these minor prophets. Well, today we end with a great crescendo of judgment uh, with Malachi. Uh, Stephen, what, what interests you about Malachi? Uh, thanks, Will. I was really pleased to um, get your invitation to join you uh, since I had led the first session about the Book of the Twelve a couple of months ago. And uh, I thought it'd be great to be here at the, uh, at the end as well. Uh, we've all had a chance now to live with the different books and different aspects of these books. You know, when I started uh, in that first session, I tried to talk about how the minor prophets are both 12 and one. Uh, and, and in a very interesting way, the tradition as it's come down to us has transmitted these books as both 12 and one. Uh, you look in your Bible and you see that each of these prophets, um, each of these prophetic books has a name uh, and each one has its own character. And each one seems to offer a different kind of snapshot of a, a moment or a series of moments in the life of ancient Israel. Uh, and that's really how we've tended to think about these books. Bible scholars, preachers, we've tended to treat them as 12 individual books, each offering a certain kind of distinctive window into the experience of this ancient community. However, something that has gotten increasing awareness, both within biblical studies, and I think within the church as well, is that these books have always, as far as we can tell, I mean, ever since they've been written, they, they've been combined into a collection and they've been transmitted in that way too. We have ancient evidence that all of these books were written and transmitted on one manuscript. And we have ancient copying rules that are different for these books than from other books. And it's clear from the copying rules from the scribes that when you wrote these books, you had to write them together. You, you, you left fewer lines between them because they were all gonna fit on one scroll. And so biblical scholars, and I think, as I say, increasingly uh, pastors and churches are, are trying to explore the significance of that. What, what does it really mean to think about this as a collection and to hear all of these 12 books in some respect uh, as kind of speaking in, in concert? And it's also, I think, clear from the New Testament that while these books were uh, 
read and heard as individual voices, they were also heard in concert. So we might think of the 12 prophets as both 12 individual voices and also something like a prophetic choir. Uh, and, and that's where this language of the 12 or the book of the 12 comes in. And for myself now, and um, you know, th this is still kind of new, there hasn't been a lot of reflection on this, but for myself, when I uh, try and study these books or approach these books, I try and ask both kinds of questions. You know, what, what are these books saying as individual witnesses? What can we learn from them in that respect? And then what does each book sort of contribute to the choir, to this book of the 12, to this 12 voiced witness? Hmm. So thinking along both of those lines at once, I thought I'd just offer two different thoughts about Malachi. Uh, they're ultimately going to be related, um, but these are the things that, that kind of stand out to me. Uh, now, if we look at Malachi as its own book, uh, it's, it's very clearly a kind of discrete book. It has its own name. Now, the name is actually a little ambiguous because Malachi, as you may have seen, could be a proper name. Malachi, we still have that name. In Hebrew, it also means my messenger. So it's not entirely clear whether it's a proper name or whether it's a job title. Uh, I think most scholars lean toward a name because the other books have names. Uh, but it's interesting that the name means messenger because messenger is a theme of this book. Uh, the structure of the book is also very clear. Uh, we've got a heading in the first verse and we have a kind of appendix in the last uh, two verses, and then in between, we've basically got a quarrel, a disputation. And the form, the format of this is really unique in the Bible. Uh, this disputation format consists of sort of three moves. The prophet makes a claim, and then he'll say something like, but you say, right? And he'll kind of quote his opponents or the people he's quarreling with. And then he'll have a response. And there are six of these speeches in the book of Malachi and this makes up the body of the word. But it's very interesting, I think, to have a book of the Bible that is essentially a quarrel, an argument, especially one in which the, the prophet's hearers um, <coughs> are sort of quoted <coughs> and characterized. And, and the whole thing, uh, there's, there's really nothing else like it, although I think the letters of Paul actually come close sometimes, because Paul can do this a little bit too. Um, but I, I just love the fact that, you know, in this book and really at the end of the 12, we've got this, this kind of quarrel, this argument. It's interesting. I don't know that we often think about the Bible as giving us an argument or a quarrel. Um, you know, and, uh, yeah, go ahead. In reading Malachi, I think of uh, at some point Walter Brueggemann friend of yours, uh, said uh, arguments, prophetic arguments, uh, quickly get overheated in scripture. And it said, and then Brueggemann said something like, reminds you of the arguments between husbands and wives in a kitchen or a bedroom, uh, that domestic arguments tend to be among the worst. And, and saying that, you know, I'm sorry if you think Yahweh has some sort of uh, dispassionate or business arrangement with Israel. No, Yahweh has bet everything Yahweh's got on Israel. And therefore, arguments in scripture tend to get overheated very quickly. And it's as if in Malachi, uh, the argument the Lord, I love it in uh, 2.17, where the Lord says, you've just worn me out. I am so wearied by you. I am just, I am just worn out by you. And uh, so uh, if it's, I love that image you, you give of the choir, but if it's a choir, this voice is yeah. contentious, polemical, uh, fierce, 
but excuse me, what was your what was your second observation there? Well, I just just to sort of wind that up, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, in this quarrel, in this argument, um, we get sort of this snapshot, this vantage point of of what seems to be going on in society at this point. We we don't know exactly when this book was written and we don't really know exactly what was going on. That is, we don't really have historical evidence outside the book of Malachi for this particular moment in Israel's life, but we certainly get a sense from the details of these disputations that this is a very challenging time economically, uh, that there are a lot of changes going on in society, and that there is a huge sense of disappointment. Now, I mean, just to plot this broadly on the timeline, this is the community of the return. So this is after the exile. And, you know, there's tremendous hopefulness that when Israel came back into the land, their problems would be over and, and the sort of ideal time would have arrived and they get back into the land and, and that is not the case. They're, they still have these Persian overlords and they've got to pay high taxes. Um, it's a very modest, small, struggling community in Jerusalem. They struggle to rebuild the temple. Um, just lost my power cord. Uh, and this is what happens in Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, and, and then once the temple is rebuilt, still, you know, the, the ideal time has not arrived. And this seems to be the situation with Malachi. How come uh, being back in Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple has not solved all our, all our problems? And some people are starting to interpret that in ways that this prophetic voice finds Ooh, really gotta, worrisome and unhelpful. I got to... I know lots of clergy who have said, if we can just get through COVID, uh, we can get back to normal. Everything will be fine. Just get over COVID. We'll go back and doing what we did before COVID. And they're finding out that is really not the case. But a little I, homiletical aside there. No, no. I, I have to say, Will, when I, I reread the, the book for today, I thought, wow, you know, gosh darn it. If Malachi doesn't seem to be a voice that really speaks to our particular moment in precisely that way, mm -hmm. you know, um, so so that that's sort of looking at Malachi as as its own book or you know one of one of the twelve. Um, let me just say one thing about how I think it fits within the book of the twelve. Uh, and again, here Malachi is kind of interesting and odd. Um, I thought, you know, if Hollywood was going to make a movie of the Book of the Twelve, I don't think they would include Malachi. I, I think they would end the movie with Zechariah 14. Because Zechariah, if you go back to Zechariah, there's also this sense of, you know, the day of the Lord and, and the big ending to history. And, and really, we get that vision in Zechariah 14. There's an earthquake. There's all this supernatural stuff. Everything in Jerusalem is made holy. It's, you know, there's, a, for a long time, there's been a joke in Jerusalem because they built a big hotel up on the Mount of Olives. And that's exactly where this earthquake in Zechariah 14 is supposed to happen. And so people have said, well, you know, that's a risky venture. It's just a matter of time. Um, but isn't it interesting that after that big kind of technicolor portrait in Zechariah 14, we come down and we're kind of mired in the nitty gritty of Malachi, the sort of quotidian everyday struggle to just kind of get by and do your business. It's, it's an interest, it makes Malachi an interesting book. It makes it an especially interesting conclusion to the book of the 12. It really brings us back to this sort of gritty reality, but it does not lose um, its interest, its own interest in the day of the Lord. And actually, uh, I think in, in terms of the book of the 12, the context of the 12, uh, it's important to see that Malachi is a, an intensely eschatological book as well. And it, it winds up the 12, the book of the 12, uh, and kind of gives it its overall character, I think, as an eschatological book. That is a book about the end times, 
a book about the day of the Lord. It's not really how the 12 begins. Um, Hosea doesn't really deal so much with the day of the Lord, but Joel and Amos do at the outset. And, and Malachi returns to it, we might say, with, with a vengeance. And you, if you look at these arguments that he has, you know, it's kind of funny. It, it, it reminds me again of a preacher, Will, because he'll say, look, here's what you need to know. And, but you say, and here's how you're resisting it. Or what, and so here's my response. And, and when he gives his response, his sort of counter argument, he tends to move in, in this eschatological direction as if he's saying, so just wait, just wait until the Lord gets here and then you'll find out. Wait till your so, father gets home. That's right. Wait till your dad gets home. So it, the whole thing kind of moves in this direction. And then we get at the very end of the book, uh, these references to Moses and Elijah. And, you know, I said this when I did the first session, there's no ancient Bible, Jewish or Christian, that ends with Malachi. We tend to think of Malachi as the last book in the Old Testament, but that's really a kind of modern invention related to the absence of the Apocrypha and printing presses. Um, in Jewish Bibles, the prophets come in the middle. In Christian Bibles, you've got books after Malachi, because you have apocryphal books. But Malachi certainly ends the Book of the Twelve, and I think there's a strong case to be made that Malachi and the Book of the Twelve ended the prophetic corpus of the Hebrew Bible. So this is kind of the ending of the prophetic word broadly in the Bible. And, and I think, I've, I've suggested this in print, uh, that these references to Moses and Elijah at the end of Malachi are, among other things, references to the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah. And so what we have here is a kind of hearkening back to and summing up of Israel's great twofold tradition of law and prophets. Uh, and that's why when we get to something like the New Testament and we find Moses and Elijah appearing, uh, among other things, they kind of represent the whole Old Testament tradition, right, at the transfiguration. That's, that's why Moses and Elijah are there, um, because they're great people from the past. But, but why Elijah? Why, why, why Moses? Because they also represent really the whole tradition, the whole Old Testament tradition. So I think that's going on at the end of Malachi, too. Um, he's, he's stressing the day of the Lord. He's pointing ahead. Um, and, uh, and this gives the whole book of the Twelve a kind of forward-looking uh, sense, uh, a, a strong sense of expectation. And that's one of the reasons why the book of the Twelve was so important to early Christians, and it really was. It was far more important to early Christians than it is to modern Christians. And you see this, especially in the passion narratives of the Old Testament. It's really interesting that books like Zechariah and other books of the Twelve are cited, particularly in the passion narratives of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Early Christians read the Book of the Twelve as one of the parts of the Old Testament that spoke the most clearly about Jesus. Yeah. So those are my two well, points. Yeah, kind of I, one I, about, I love that image. about the I love that image of the choir, these different voices. I think the thing that impresses me about the voice of Malachi is it is a uh, fierce, judgmental voice. It, it reminds me when it talks about the day of the Lord to, in the Messiah, when <clears throat> the bass steps up and talks about the refiner's fire uh, and the music picks up and everything. Uh, so we get some talk about this climactic day of the Lord. Uh, hey, God is coming and it's not going to be pretty. Uh, the Lord is coming and the Lord is going to work justice. Uh, that's good news and bad news. It's great that you say musical, Will. Um, some of you, if you read the book of Malachi, you may have noticed, particularly at the beginning of the third chapter, um, you may have had Handel's Messiah yeah. in your ear, if, yeah. you were, if you know Handel's Messiah, because uh, Handel set verses from Malachi uh, at the beginning of that to kind of set up the story of the Messiah. And, and that's, this, that's really a kind of wonderful example of this traditional Christian 
exegetical mm -hmm. logic. Uh, Handel, Handel read it the way Christians had for generations. So when he sets these texts about the priests of Levi and the refiner's fire and the day of his coming, that's right from Malachi and it's understood as kind of setting the scene for the advent of Christ. Yeah. Which then raises the question, what, what do you do if you've got a Christianity without Malachi, uh, without judgment, without in the Messiah, it it has this <clears throat> apocalyptic emphasis. The day of the Lord is coming. It comes with this advent of this baby, and uh, uh, I I wonder that Malachi sounds so judgmental and fierce to our ears, maybe because we're in the grip of a Christianity which has no judgment and no sense of God's uh, negative assessment of us and who we are. Uh, and so maybe therefore Malachi's, uh, Stan Harwas and I a couple of weeks ago did an article in the Christian Century uh, on pastoral care, and maybe we made some critical <laughs> comments about uh, the current practice of pastoral care is done by some clergy. And it's interesting, in we, we got a lot of negative response to what we said. And most of the negative judgmental response against our article is kind of saying, how dare you make negative comments about clergy and the church at this moment? We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're exempt from judgment. Uh, uh, you obviously don't have enough empathy with all those dear, struggling, sweet pastors who are doing the best they can in the present moment. It, it's just, and it's, it's just sort of saying, you know, I'm sorry, we're suffering right now, and uh, therefore judgment is utterly inappropriate. Well, I can imagine Israel saying to Malachi, "Hey, uh, we got." Persia on our necks. Uh, Jerusalem has not been restored fully. Uh, how dare you hold us to account? How dare you? Uh, so I, I think it is a surprisingly interesting book in that way, particularly seen from a church which says uh, Christ is all loving, all affirming, all embracing. And you can only say that, by the way, with by excluding about half the things Jesus talks about. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think what people miss, Will, is that you are hard on pastors because you actually believe in the church. Uh, thank you for that defense. Be yeah. Nice if you would write that into the Christian century. Yeah, uh, yeah. but I uh, mean, a, a lot of the people who I think are willing to give pastors a pass are willing to do yeah. so because just doesn't really yeah. matter that much yeah. you know and that's very I, much like that's very much like malachi it, he is which, absolutely committed to temple and priests yeah. and that's why he's giving them a hard time that's a good point that uh a book that can be read to be so negative of, about our worship about the priesthood maybe could be seen as one of the most stunning affirmations that hey folks a lot is stake in our worship, a lot is at stake in our leadership, and therefore they are being held to a high standard. And I, I think that's yeah. exactly what Malachi is trying to get at. Exactly. And I um, like the fact that it's it's couched in a kind of um, God has a quarrel with uh, Israel and all because. Uh, God is totally committed to Israel. In, in the beginning of Malachi, it says, uh, the Lord, uh, Israel said, hey, what have you done for us lately? Uh, and the Lord starts re enumerating uh, everything God has done and to say, look, and, and here's your response to what I've done. I must say, uh, Carol asked me, had I ever preached from Malachi? And I remember definitely, Malachi didn't come up much in the lectionary. Uh, which is an interesting commentary in itself, but it came up one Sunday, 
And so I preached as a challenge on Malachi. And I noted how this rip-roaring, fierce judgment, uh, these calls to justice, this notion you're going to be punished because of the way you've conducted yourselves. God is coming, you know. Uh, well, I noted, wow, this is not being addressed to you, the congregation. This is being addressed to clergy, to the priesthood, to me. <laughs> and uh, it is one of the most uh, sweeping indictments of religious leaders that we've got. And it's kind of cheap for religious leaders to read Malachi and say, oh, look, uh, uh, how you're being criticized by God. It, as I read it, it's the priests who are being yeah. criticized by God. And uh, the uh, Malachi 3, uh, you know, the Lord is coming and it's going to burn you up. Uh, there is going to be hell to pay uh, for you priest. Uh, those well, of you, yeah. That's so strong that there's actually this curious phrase about a covenant <laughs> with Levi. This is the only time yeah. in the whole okay. Old Testament that we hear Good anything point. about that. Yeah. So there's yeah. clearly in this tradition a kind of special relationship with the yeah. priesthood. What, what's also important to see, and it's easy to have it be lost in the mix because it goes by so quickly, but Malachi, in fact, is kind of stunning in terms of how it conceives of other nations, nations beyond Israel. Mm -hmm. I mean, Malachi is so tough on priests and so tough on Israel but Malachi is very broad-minded about other nations. I mean, the, the key verse here is 111, right? Mm -hmm. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations, and in every place incense is offered to my name and a pure offering, for my name is great among the nations. I mean, that sounds like everywhere people worship, yeah, they're worshiping me. And mm -hmm. that is a stunning claim to Amazing. find in the Old Testament. This is why you'll often see this verse on the cover of a worship bulletin, even today in some churches, um, because it's it's read, you know, traditionally in Christianity mm -hmm. as a kind of prophetic foretaste of what happens yeah. with with Jesus and the gospel, that the, the gospel is a way of taking the good news of Israel's God mm -hmm. to all the Gentile nations. And that seems to be what Malachi is understanding and, um, and talking about too. And being the last verse, the last uh, book in the Old Testament, if, if we take it as, as we have it now, moving into the New Testament, it, it can be read that segment as uh, leading into the universalism, you know, of Matthew and uh, going out. Uh, uh, again, I, I don't mean to harp on this, but it, I am struck by the vitriol, the anti-clerical comments uh, of Malachi, <laughs> which we well deserve. Uh, I began the, today by listening to a podcast that Harriet uh, called my attention to on cults, and it's looking uh, at one segment, looking at mega churches as cults, and uh, looking at this cult of celebrity that mega churches are into, where you have various uh, screen personalities and all are, are attracted to the church and giving their testimonials and all, and. Uh, uh, I thought it ironic then going to Malachi, who says, uh, you know, when leaders, clergy are unfaithful, uh, a lot of sad things happen. A lot of good people are damaged uh, through it. And I thought of um, that episode, Jesus and the Widow's Might where Jesus is watching everybody stream into the temple and he sees this widow giving everything she's got into the temple treasury. 
And I've, I've often preached that was this dear woman, unlike you, uh, has given everything she has. All you're giving us is a measly two or three percent off the top, uh, where she gave everything. Well, um, a commentator helped me look at that passage as a whole, and Jesus rips into the clergy, the priesthood, saying, uh, uh, "To hell with you! Uh, you have divided houses. You have extorted uh, from the widows. You have taken from the poor." So maybe when Jesus says, he, he's standing there and he says, look at this poor woman. She's giving everything she's got to this corrupt, accommodated priesthood and its temple mechanism. Isn't this sad people? Well, I thought of Malachi and his notion of the way uh, leaders have preyed on people's uh, economic status and injustice. Anyway, um, I think it's 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 tough on clergy. <laughs> uh, you know, one thing that I'm when you make the the connection, will between what Malachi is describing, what's being described in this book, and and kind of the situation of the church today and clergy mm -hmm. and religious leaders, I'm 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 grateful for that because I think that there have been times in the past when books like Malachi have been read in an anti-Jewish way. You know, that, that mm. what people, oh, oh, look at the problems uh, in ancient Israel. Look yeah. at, this is a portrait of, you know, what was wrong with Judaism. Um, how, how do you think, how do you, you sort know, of see that problem? How do we avoid that kind of anti-Jewish? It can be reading? read as, uh, see, Malachi is showing these Jews were all caught up in this corrupt priesthood, this temple mechanism that Jesus brought down. Well, no, that's that's a misreading of Jesus. But I guess looking at it today, I'm thinking my own church seems so tender uh, about criticism. Uh, in the ethos in which we're in, it's it's like, uh, well, uh, we're all doing the best we can in the present moment. And uh, remember, these megachurch pastors with these big salaries and all, they do a lot of good for a lot of people, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, it, I, I have such an admiration that Malachi believes so deeply. Life and death matters are at stake here, people. And the way you worship is a big deal. It is... Uh, can be either life giving or death dealing. Uh, wow, it it I find it humbling, and uh, so often in the church there's this thing about well people mean well and we're all doing the best we can, and uh, uh, our our pastor didn't have time to prepare a sermon today because clergy are just so busy uh, doing good. And, well, Malachi is saying, I I'm sorry, um, <laughs> cosmic consequences about how you worship are at stake. Em uh, maybe we ought to open it up for Emily. Did you have your hand up there? I have. I did, but I did not want to interrupt you. No, well, let, let's, why don't we have a conversation? Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say, I, I actually just took a training yesterday. I'm in the Virginia conference, and I just took a training yesterday on lay servant ministry, and it talked about the priesthood of all believers, mm -hmm. and I, I have a marketing background, and I definitely believe in um, consumer, um, just consumer responsibility, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I, while in the Old Testament, they talk about, um, I, I know they're coming down on the clergy, but when you think about the resurrection, when I think about the resurrection, I think about that's kind of God bringing us all into the same place, right? And so it's not, um, I think of this. I was going through the discernment process in the Episcopal Church, and um, I happened to sit across the um, I happened to sit across the hall when I was interning with my old church um, from this 
rector who I I had no idea who he was. Um, he just was this older gentleman sitting across the hall from me and is very, very kind as I was going through the process of discernment. Very humble, very approachable, amazing man. I walked into later on in the process, I walked into their hall and one of the parishioners had donated this bigger than life um, painting <laughs> of this man. And I thought about if I had seen that picture first, <laughs> I would never have talked to this guy because I would have been scared silly. And it just, I think if you don't understand what the role of clergy is, is not a substitute for God, right? That, that mm. clergy are mm. their people, just like we are, then you're misunderstanding. And so that matter of life and death, I mean, I think about Moses going through the Red Sea and all those people that followed Moses, good for them. But then what about the people who followed the wrong person, right? They followed the Pharaoh instead, and then they got swallowed up. And yeah. so if we're not very careful about knowing the truth about Christ ourselves and not depending on clergy to, um, to make up all the difference, I, I mean, you, you can if you follow the wrong leader and if you're following a clergy person instead of Christ, you're, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> so. And I think it's right. And it, but when you are an ordained leader, it, it, it's tough, but you use the phrase servant leader. Yeah. Um, it's tough because you've got to, like in preaching, you got to stand up and talk. And you've got to try to be interesting and you've got to try to say, hey, folks, listen to me. I got something to say that's important. Well, when do you slip over into like unrestrained ego? And when do you slip into manipulation in your speaking? Um, I, I do that, but and usually don't know I've done it till after it's over. But uh, it, it, it is a challenge. And it's also... You're reminding me, Emily, in the context of Malachi, that I remember I read a book a few years ago called uh, Leadership in Scripture or the Bible and Leadership or something. And the author, an Episcopal priest, said, when you look at Scripture in regard to the issues of church leadership, <clears throat> it's basically one long critique in the same direction negative. <laughs> and, and you can read it that way. It is kind of amazing how scripture keeps battering leaders. Uh, just uh, this summer in the lectionary, we've been through David, the, the first Samuel sagas. And uh, wow, it's just amazing how scripture extols David and at the same time presents David as a deeply flawed, weak human being. Um, would we be, are we as honest about our leaders? Uh, and, and so. Uh, I, and, I think, I, and yeah. if I may, um, you know, at the same time in the biblical story, New Testament as well as old, isn't it interesting that God keeps summoning up leaders? Um, I mean, absolutely. You know, the, the story of the Bible is really, yeah. in some ways, yeah. the story of God continually calling up specific individuals into positions of leadership yeah so it it's a kind of messy both and it seems to me uh in the end i remember uh well the calling of the 12 disciples you know that you call the 12 and they are given the same leadership responsibilities that jesus is doing to heal to preach and everything and then the 12 are portrayed so negatively <laughs> throughout and, and maybe those of us called to leadership uh, may take heart in that, that God, and, and maybe in Malachi, uh, Malachi is, you know, saying you, you are utterly flawed, you have perverted justice, however, uh, uh, I am still going to hold you to account, I am still working with you, I am still demanding of you. 
And that may be, is that a statement of faith in these leaders or a, a, an utter uh, condemnation of them? Well, I, I think I, I like your saying it, it's, it's sort of a statement of faith that uh, but I, I, I'm vesting like a lot point. in you. I like the point about the priesthood of all believers and, and mm -hmm. sort of lay responsibilities and, and prerogatives. I think that's right. I think we've done a really not very good job of helping people understand how, how you can live into the Christian life as a lay person. Um, and I, I wish that churches would do a lot more with that. In fact, I would go a step further. I, um, you know, the three big roles in the Old Testament are prophet, priest, and king. There are mm -hmm. others, but those are the three big ones. And I find it a little bit um, disappointing that when we start talking about this, we only talk about the priesthood of all believers. I, I wish, frankly, that we would also talk about something like the prophethood of all believers, which, mm -hmm. if you think about Joel as one of the messages of Joel, as well as the New Testament, uh, and maybe there's a way of talking about sort of the royal dimension of the Christian life for every believer. I mean, in fact, that kind of relates for me all the way um, back to Genesis 1. Um, uh, you know, we're told there that human beings are made in the image of God. And in, in a historical context, um, that notion of image of that is royal language. That, that's the language you use of a statue or a representation mm -hmm. of, of a king, which stands for a king. So we're, we're told at the very outset of the creation story that there's something royal or just as royal about every human being uh, as there is, you know, the, the, the people that we you know, normally think of as kings. And you know, kings. Uh, when Emily... So we could expand Emily on that, I think the priesthood of believers thing, I was thinking, wow, if I get ever a chance to preach on Malachi again, uh, maybe my point would be, look at this scathing criticism of the priesthood. And yet Christians believe you're a priest, <laughs> you're ordained, it's called baptism. Now, <laughs> so all this dumping on the clergy that Malachi does, uh, wow. It now applies to you uh, in your priestly ministry in the world. And you're being held now to the same standards that Malachi is applying to the Levites. Uh, that, that's a sobering thought. And- uh, I love uh, that. Yeah, it, you know, uh, when uh, like in Ephesians, and when Paul was talking about, what, what is the purpose of Christian leadership? It's to equip the saints for the work of ministry. We're, my job is to equip everybody else to go out and be in ministry in the world. Well, equipping the saints in Malachi means get ready to be held to a high standard of judgment. You are God's showcase out into the world. Well, God expects a lot out of you. And, uh, and and the day of the Lord is coming. <laughs> yeah, and the day of the Lord is. Uh, I heard a preacher one time talk about. Uh, he had this dream of that he had died, and he <clears throat> went into eternity, and there was Saint Peter to who to welcome him into eternity. And St. Peter said, uh, third Sunday after Pentecost, what the heck were you thinking when you used that stupid illustration of, of you know, in your sermon? And uh, he said, well, what, what do you, I don't remember. And he said, you don't even remember? Anyway, the, the pastor said it was a dream of judgment, of being held to account for how I have Proclaim the word of God. Well, priesthood of believers says, hey, all of us baptized are, are going to be held to account for how we proclaimed and lived uh, 
in the, are there any other uh, comment? When, when we need to stop, Carol? Uh, 10, 1045, 15 more minutes. Okay, so I think Elmina and Christian uh, both had comments. Okay. okay. Oh, uh, I've had a, the only time I remember hearing sermons about Malachi very much was <clears throat> growing up in the Southern Baptist Church, Malachi ah. 310. Um, about stewardship season comes around and we got to bring all the tithes into the storehouse. <laughs> all and, right. But now from what you're saying this morning, I mean, that I might have been that the priests were misusing the tithes that had been presented. And maybe they weren't all brought into the storehouse. Who knows? But um, that's all I could remember from Malachi. And um, that's just a comment. That's okay. <laughs> That's yeah. one uh, one okay. thing people don't always realize is that ancient temples, among other things, were the banks. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I've actually seen uh, an ancient temple in Rome that had a lockbox on the outside uh, where you would put your money in. Um, you know, there there weren't separate banks, so. When we think about temples and tithes, uh, we actually need to think a little bit more broadly uh, about how these temples were kind of in the position of regulating a lot of the commerce. If you took out a business loan or something like that, it, it, the, it's the temple and the temple personnel who would handle that. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything was kind of um, you know, mixed together uh, economically and, and It is, uh, though... Elaine's comment about that uh, while we were using Malachi to say, bring in your money, bring in the ties. Elaine is, I'm hearing Elaine point to the fact yeah. that, well, Malachi is saying, uh. Right, he, he's actually tithes? criticizing that. Right. That's right. Yeah. I remember yeah. Uh, one Sunday yeah. when I appealed, I was at the offering, I said, uh, this is your way of being in mission with the church. This is your way of reaching out in compassion to the world. And the chair of the finance committee came out and said, uh, preacher, uh, are you comfortable with presenting the offering as a time to be in mission and reaching out to the world? When by my reckoning, 85% of the money we take in is used within this congregation. And I said, I can't stand lay people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think Malachi would say, uh, good question. Okay, priest, yeah. what's your answer to that? Any, anyway, it was- I mean, he, he is criticizing <laughs> people for not supporting the temple uh, and its work. So he is yeah. criticizing them for withholding money. But I think there's also a critique here about how the money is being used, how it's being spent. Um, and it, there's kind of criticism all the way around. Yeah. Were there other, I can't see the comments section, but were there other? Oh, yes. Yeah. John? Uh, uh, Will, Chris Wilson, whom you may remember from many sure years ago at Tennessee Wesleyan and Elon, but in any case, I'm, I'm struck by this, the same text, uh, three, eight, and uh, and following, and I did hear it preached. It seemed every year during stewardship month. Uh, a few years ago, uh, quite a few years ago, uh, I was uh, asked to write the article on the word tithe for the Anchor Bible Dictionary. And when I got into that, I, when I got into the New Testament, I found that every reference to the to tithe was negative. Uh, and then I was writing another little book for the, for the uh, United Methodist Church on the, the title I was given, it was, uh, the tithe, 10% of what, what, and I was supposed to write about, oh, I was very conflicted about, uh, because I became less and less sure, uh, 
that the tithe about this whole uh, situation of tithing, it certainly was a good guilt advice uh, for <laughs> pastors. And I, I want to know what uh, you and Steve think about tithing. I'm not a Baptist. Uh, we Methodists never mentioned tithing, but uh... <laughs> Stephen, are you? Well, I I think there is a real danger of legalism uh, with regard to tithing, and um, and I think that it has been sort of taught and preached often in a and continues to be in a legalistic manner, and I think that that needs to be avoided. Um, uh, more than it is. On the other hand, you know, I, I think it's good to support the church financially. Uh, and I think, um, uh, you know, without understanding that in a legalistic way, I think it's something that um, we can encourage Christians to do. Uh, I, you know, I don't know that we should think about the Bible as giving us one model or a kind of recipe for how to think about um, money in relation to the church. Uh, I would try and take a broader view, um, and I think it'd be good to imagine different ways of thinking about how we give and different kinds of strategies. I'll just say for me personally, uh, you know, I was challenged at a certain point not to think uh, about, you know, a set amount or something like that, but to think more about a percentage. Um, uh, and I have found that to be really spiritually rich. I like the way that it pushes me to kind of connect uh, my earnings and my givings and to kind of take stock of the whole situation. Um, so again, without thinking about that in a legalistic mm -hmm. way, um, you know, I, I, I think there are different ways to approach the, the, I don't know that tithe is the best language to use because I think it does tend to get understood legalistically. Um, it isn't, tithe is a percentage, right? Or is it? Well, is I think it's understood it, variously. I mean, okay. a lot of people understand it as 10% or whatever, yeah. but, um, you know, I, I think, again, people, yeah. They go in different directions. It goes back to uh, the Abraham and Melchizedek back in uh, yeah. uh, Genesis, Genesis 14 that Abraham gave to him a tenth of everything. Yeah. And that tenth seems to, to come in several other places mm -hmm. in the Old I, Testament. I do. I, I think it is interesting in our culture uh that that money becomes a really interesting revelation of who we are and i presume we're never more self-deceitful than when it comes to money and we have all kinds of rationale uh, i was chair of the united way drive at duke for three years in a row and uh, the only thing I learned from that is academic people are some of the stingiest, miserly people that I know. <laughs> Christian, knowing that Chris, you're academic. But, um, mm -hmm. and what I loved was the letters I would get from faculty telling me why they weren't going to give any money to the United Way. And it was always about, I have objections about the Boy Scouts or this organization or that. And I, I wanted, I didn't, but I wanted to write them back and say, spare me all the intellectual rationale. You're just too damn tight to give any money to, to the community. Fine. I'm okay with that. I can, you're not even a Christian. What do I care? And uh, I, I do think that uh, some of these passages that deal with material responsibility are important. Uh, Justice uh, just read a book on reparations uh, for African-Americans. And the book said, you know, 
reparations is complicated and all, but, and, and the author said, uh, here's an example of if you're white and you're a person of means, why don't you start your own little reparations program in what you tie, what you tipped a, a, a service person, et cetera. And um, I was just thinking, I, I do like, and, and one last thing, and that is that uh, in the church I grew up in, uh, that that talk about tithing and stewardship and giving was sometimes at its best a way of dignifying the labor of ordinary people uh, to say to someone, you don't make a lot of money in what you do, but you get to come to church on Sunday and put it on the altar and it becomes a labor of love uh, to God. It, it becomes your little contribution to, the, to some larger good. And I'm the one that invented in the Duke Chapel service that, you know, the praying of the doxology as we bring the plates up to the altar. And I remember I got a letter, an indignant letter from a professor at Divinity School who said, uh, I resent that the highlight of Sunday worship in Duke Chapel is now the collecting and putting of money up on the altar. And I wrote back and I said, I bet you do, don't you? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, me, and, yeah. You know, it's, it's helpful, I think, too, to keep the conversation about tithes together with a sense of the alternatives. You know, there are religious communities where people have to pay dues. And by yeah. and large, you know, we don't do God. that. Um, yeah. I, I had a German friend come when I was pastoring a church in New Haven and attend the service. And he also really bristled at this whole business of passing the plate and praying mm -hmm. over the money. Uh, and he sort of challenged me about it afterwards and said, you know, this is not biblical. And I said, well, but in your culture, uh, you support the the churches through your tax system and you have an established church mm -hmm. uh and in in this country with separation of church and state you know we we can't do that we have to do this differently so you know taxes are one way some cultures do this dues are a way mm -hmm. that some religious communities do this you know you, the church needs to be supported so you have to kind of think well how is this actually going to happen and, and i did wonder there were moments when i of of rare self criticism when I would wonder at Duke Chapel uh, when I was there uh, as dean, uh, does it make any difference that my salary is not paid by the people, <laughs> that I'm an employee of the university? And um, Patsy and I have been watching the National Cathedral uh, frequently on Sundays. And it's just amazing to see these Episcopalians at this elegant National Cathedral Every Sunday, the dean comes out and says, we get no tax money. We get no money from the Episcopal Church. We need your help. We need you now more than ever. If this service has blessed you, we need you. Look at the screen. Here's the way you can contribute. We'll take credit card. You know, And I think it's a kind of a, a wonderful way of saying you get to participate in this, and I'm also, to some degree, uh, accountable to you. I got to say, uh, with Malachi, my you maybe have heard this story from me, but my last church before coming to Duke Chapel was next door to the synagogue, and the we, the rabbi and I'd have coffee on Mondays, and the rabbi said to me, because uh, we had a banner out on the church lawn, uh, "What's a stewardship? What what stewardship? What what is that?" And I said, well, it's when we consider our uh, obligation to support the work of the church. And he said, money? You talking about money? And I said, yeah. He says, well, what, what do you do? Stewardship. I said, well, it's when people consider what God has given them and what they should give back to the church. And he said, what? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. And I said, well, how do you do it in the synagogue? He said, they get a bill. Uh, we have a committee. They get a bill. He said, we're Jews. I don't give a rip about them considering how much they should give to the Lord, okay? We tell them how much they should give to the Lord. We're Jews. And, and I sort of 
I like that. Well, here, our time's up. Thank you, Will and Stephen, so much for um, bringing this, all this information to light. You never know where a conversation is going to go. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for what we have received. Uh, Will, would you offer us a closing prayer? I'm grateful. Lord, we thank you for assembling us as your church. Uh, we realize that we have been the beneficiaries of so many gifts. Uh, help us uh, through the prophet uh, to realize that we're also held accountable uh, for your beneficence, uh, that you love us enough to have expectations for us. And therefore, we pray, strengthen us, help us to be people who can hear your truth spoken to us uh, without resenting you for it and enable us better to live our lives so that others may see you uh, through us. Amen. <laughs>